Norcross. Angelica Nelson. Deeds, not words. Alice Paul's exploration of the British suffrage movement, which transformed the movement in America. As long as women consent to being unjustly governed, they will be. Emily Pankhurst, 1913. The American suffrage movement began in 1848, but by 1912, only nine states had granted full suffrage, and no national amendment was in sight. Until a young Quaker woman, Alice Paul, brought fresh perspective and new tactics to the American suffrage movement. In 1907, when Alice Paul traveled to England, she explored the British suffrage movement, the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU, and experienced a new, more aggressive approach to advocating for the women's rights to vote. Upon her return to the United States in 1910, Alice Paul became a leader in the American suffrage movement, exchanging traditional pacifist ideas for the more militant tactics that she had explored in England. She created her own movement in 1913, the National Women's Party, which followed the motto of the WSPU, deeds, not words. By using a more aggressive approach, the American people were forced to encounter this movement. This pressured President Wood Woodrow Wilson to urge legislative action, which led to the passing of the 19th Amendment, granting all women in the United States the right to vote. I, Alice Paul, grew up with the Quaker belief that all people are created equal and deserving of the same rights. We also believed that the way to resolve conflict was through peaceful negotiation, even if it meant progress was slow. However, in 1907, I traveled to England to study, where I then explored the Pankhurst women's ideas and tactics. Emily Pankhurst and her daughters were the leaders of the Women's Social and Political Union and prominent figures of the fight for equal rights. I saw how they brought with so much vigor and passion. I still remember the day that I first heard a speech given by Christabel Pankhurst in 1907. Meetings have been held and petitions signed in favor of votes for women, but failure has been the result. The reason for this failure is that women have not been able to bring pressure to bear on the government. Government moves only in response to pressure. We must not sign papers and have quiet meetings, because quiet will not get us anywhere. We must smash windows, march down the street, make some noise. Hearing the speech was the first time that I realized that the pacifist values that I cherished were perhaps not the only way to make progress, and perhaps not the best way. We are here to claim our rights as women, not only to be free, but to fight for freedom. It is our privilege, as well as our pride and joy, to take some part in this militant movement, which, as we believe, means a regeneration of all humanity. Remember the dignity of your womanhood. Take courage. Join hands. Stand beside us. Fight with us. And always remember, deeds, not words. Deeds, not words. Soon, I found myself practicing this motto and I decided it was time to fight alongside people like Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst. Although I had supported women's suffrage from a young age, my exploration of the Pankhurst ideas caused me to become connected to the cause. And so I decided to join the Women's Social and Political Union, which was a suffrage organization in Britain. Christabel, I want to thank you for showing me that in order for men to accept the political enfranchisement of women, they must not be persuaded but alarmed. When I first arrived in Britain, I was under the assumption that my Quaker beliefs would prevent me from joining such a militant movement. But after being inspired by you and your mother, I now understand why women are engaging in such dramatic methods of protest. Burning down buildings, chaining themselves to important political institutions, cutting down telephone lines, and smashing windows. These actions are extreme, but necessary. After years of being invisible and mistreated, Oh, it is absurd what actions we must take to draw attention to an issue that should not even be an issue in the first place. I'm greatly appreciative of all the brave women who have and will continue to sacrifice so much for our movement, including you, Alice. I've been thinking, while well, you have done amazing things to help our movement here, I believe it is time for you to return to America. You can bring new energy to the movement there. It would benefit them greatly. Take our tactics home and add new fire to the American suffrage movement. Although I hate to abandon a fight that is not yet won, I do agree that the American movement is in need of some new ideas. Perhaps I can talk to Anna Howard Shaw, the president of NASA, 
about incorporating some of the British tactics to put pressure on those in power. Alice Paul, hmm. I hear that you have recently returned from England. I do hope that you are not here to propose those radical tactics used by women there. Those hostile acts are entirely un-American. I will accommodate no efforts at a national amendment. We are working diligently and effectively at the adoption of amendments to state constitutions. Uh, Miss Shaw, these methods that you call absurd have caused the British movement to progress farther in 10 years than you have in over 20. Well, I respect your dedication to the cause, campaigning state by state, and having quiet meetings behind closed doors simply won't garner the attention needed to give all women the right to vote. It's 1912 and only nine states have granted full suffrage. We need to garner national attention to our cause. We need to hold the party in power responsible for a federal suffrage amendment. Right now, we are simply too easy to ignore. Miss Paul, young women in your generation simply do not understand that we must maintain our dignity while taking the stand. I have worked alongside women like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and like them, I remain unalterably opposed to militancy. I believe nothing of permanent value has ever been secured by it that could not have been more easily obtained by more peaceful methods. If you insist on pursuing this radicalism, then perhaps there is no place for you in our organization. We have no room for hooligans drawing negative attention to women's suffrage. Perhaps negative attention is better than no attention at all. The following year, when a fellow suffragette, Lucy Burns and I, applied for NASA membership, we were both denied because of our radicalism. Although this rejection was hard to take at the time, it compelled us to form our own organization, called the National Women's Party, which focused on more militant strategies, such as picketing. And Lucy, the spectacular parade we organized with over 5,000 suffragettes the day before President Wilson's inauguration day was a glorious event. We are now moving our efforts to the White House, determined to hold President Wilson and the party in power responsible for denying democracy to women. Our young men are off to foreign lands to fight for democracy in the Great War, but we women of America know that America itself is not a democracy, as long as 20 million women are denied the right to vote. So we must fight for democracy on the home front. People think that we are being un-American by protesting during the Great War. But Lucy, what could be more American than fighting to gain democracy for all? The reasons why women should have the vote are obvious to every fair-minded person. If women are expected to obey the laws, shouldn't they have a say in who makes the laws? Have you heard the absurd things that pass and rush out as we're protesting? Would she abandon her family? <coughs> A woman who takes proper care of her households has no time for politics. Women are already represented by their husbands. We are mocked every day. Do you remember that day when those men attacked us and we were arrested? It was ridiculous. So when we were jailed at the Occupant Workhouse in Virginia, we protested by going on hunger strike. The prison resorted to force feeding us, as they didn't want anyone dying for the cause, through fear that it would draw even more attention to the suffrage movement. Force feeding was one of the most dreadful experiences of my life. They strapped me down so tight that it was hard to breathe. Then they'd force a tube down my nostril, which was torturously painful. Sometimes they'd attempt it twice or more times, creating indescribable pain. Then they would pour raw eggs and milk down the tube, despite my violent opposition. These actions were nothing short of torture. When news of these force feedings were publicized, the public was outraged by this horrible treatment that we had to endure. This, along with the picketing at the White House, which took place six days a week for two and a half years, caused the public to look at our issue in new light, and soon opinion swung in favor of granting women the right to vote. This forced President Woodrow Wilson to publicly announce his stance on the issue in support of women's suffrage. President Wilson gave voice to what we have believed for so long when he said, Shall we admit women only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil, and not to a partnership of privilege and right? On August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment was passed, granting women in all 48 states the right to vote. The strategies that Alice Paul used were adopted by many other organizations, 
and continue to influence how they fought for civil rights. As President Barack Obama stated in April 2016, Alice Wall was a brilliant community organizer and political strategist. I want young girls and boys to know that women fought for equality. It was not just given to them. I want them to be astonished to know that there was ever a time when women could not vote. Through Alice Wall's exploration of the British suffrage movement, the American people were forced to encounter the movement in America, which was a turning point for American women's suffrage. Alice Paul was truly an unsung hero, and she accomplished this all through following the motto, Deeds, Not Words.